this is a big deal, and no one has been talking about it. Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. A couple living every parent's worst nightmare. The horrible scene that we walked in on, the only thing that could have been worse is if it had been intentional. He didn't kill himself. It is poisoning and murder. When you're buying this stuff, you have no idea what you're getting. And it can happen. He was not a drug addict. He was not a rebel. To anyone. I unlocked the door, and that's when I realized he had foam coming out of his mouth. And I just remember curling up in the corner, yelling at Tom to do something. My mom was on the ground, screaming. If we had known that our son had any kind of drug, he would still be alive right now. Today, a couple living every parent's worst nightmare. Dr. Laura Berman is a well-known and beloved television host and relationship doctor. She has hosted a show on the Oprah Winfrey Network and a podcast. But she's not just a TV doctor, she is also a mother. And she is here today to warn parents that even with her expertise, she could not protect her teenage son from the dangers lurking on the internet. On Sunday, February 7th, Dr. Berman and her husband, Sam Chapman, discovered their 16-year-old son, Sammy, dying on the floor of his bedroom. He passed away just 30 minutes later. He overdosed on drugs that they claim he ordered from someone using the social media platform, Snapchat. Popular celebrity therapist who just lost her 16-year-old son to a drug overdose. She says that he was a straight-A student who they watched closely, but not enough when it came to social media. A heartbroken Dr. Laura Berman and her husband say their 16-year-old son Sammy was getting ready to apply to college and wanted to travel the world. They never imagined his life would end like this. Dr. Laura Berman says her son received the drugs from an online dealer. And like so many kids, he had been sheltering at home in Santa Monica during this pandemic where she believed he was safe. But their world came crashing down when Dr. Berman says she walked into her son's bedroom to talk about a summer internship. The heartbroken family believes their son purchased the drugs from someone he met on the social media app Snapchat, which allows private messages to be deleted immediately after reading them, which could make it difficult to find out what really happened. This was a total shock, and I don't think that's the right word when you walk in and you find your son dead on the floor. I, I wish it were me. Laura Berman shared this emotional post on Instagram. It says this, my beautiful boy is gone. Despite her grief, Dr. Berman says she is choosing to speak out in hopes their tragedy can save other children. Parents can use our son as a teachable moment. He had so many dreams and so many plans that won't be fulfilled. Wow, guys, um, I am so very sorry for your loss. Thank you. I, I just, I, I don't, one thing you won't hear me say is I know how you feel. Yeah. I, I just cannot even imagine. Robin and I both just have talked about it and are so sorry for your loss. Thank, Thank you. you. And Sam, as a father, I, I can't even imagine uh, what your emotions have been through this. And this has happened such a short time ago. Thank you for having the strength and courage to come out and talk about this cautionary tale. Why did you want to talk about this? Um, I didn't start off wanting to talk about it. I wanted to crawl into a hole and die. Um, but people kept asking, and I just kept, at first I just said no, and then I started realizing that every time I talk about this, maybe even just one kid can be saved. And this is the only way that we're going to change the circumstances that not only killed him, but what I'm now learning are thousands and thousands and thousands of other children just like him. I mean, it's it's worse than COVID, what's happening to our children right now. Tell us about 
your son? I mean, because this people have the the misconception sometimes that you know here's just some druggie that OD'd, and that could not be further from the case here. T talk to us about no. Sammy. Um, you know, he was a great kid. You know, the one thing that keeps coming to me from his peers, from his teachers, is just how sweet he was, how kind, um, really, really funny. Lots and lots and lots of plans and dreams, you know, straight A or almost straight A student, depending on the semester, he was taking Latin and a full load of courses. He just talked to me that morning about um, coming to his room and, you know, that afternoon, which is when I found him to uh, plan an internship. He couldn't play football this year. You know, we're in a total lockdown. He, he had no exercise, no outlet. You know, say I thought, and I just said to my girlfriend, you know, we were saying the one silver lining of the shutdown is that I have both my teenage boys stuck at home. And they're mm. like, you know, nothing is going to happen to him in his freaking room. How was he responding to the quarantine and the lockdown? It, it does take its toll on young men. He was frustrated. I think he longed for social interaction. Uh, but we didn't forbid social interaction. We would let him play with a few friends whose families were being careful and... We had no idea, Phil. This was just out of the blue for us. There was nothing that would have given us a tip that our son was up in a room on Snapchat uh, communicating with a drug dealer. Or that he could get them delivered to the house. You believe that what happened is that he, he went on Snapchat and there was a, a dealer on there that had a drug menu, right? That's right. In fact, his, his best friend told us what happened, and he produced the actual menu that our son had sent him. So we know where the menu came from, and it was uh, delivered on Snapchat, and it had a whole beautiful, colorful list of drugs you could choose from, and it said uh, home delivery. Right. And this is the menu that, that was produced. So this is, this is on a social media platform that children can go to. And I say children because he's 16. Yes. I never imagined that this was on Snapchat. Yeah. And and it's not just Snapchat. It's all the social right. media. And, you know, we, we haven't confirmed this forensically, so we have to say allegedly. Yes. What do you think he got and what did he get? We believe he ordered a Percocet. That's what his friend told us. Uh -huh. And the police believe it was laced with fentanyl. He fell backwards, um, passed out, threw up, and choked on his vomit, which is a classic reaction to fentanyl. Their respiration slows down to the point where they start losing control of their body, fall to the ground. In fact, there are college students who are doing this intentionally with fentanyl and risking their lives, and they take a backpack and they put it on front wise in what they call turtling, turtling so right. that they fall forward and w if they throw up they don't choke on it so you think he just ordered one we honestly don't know that's what we were told but you didn't find 10 more we in looked the room everywhere we found nothing the police found nothing else in his room mm -hmm. we found nothing else in his room and they were the ones that gave us our first education on, you know, fentanyl-laced drugs. And they said he was in what they call the fentanyl death pose. And right. when we showed them, they were still in the house when his friend sent that screenshot. And when we showed it to them, we were like, okay, now we can find this person. And they said, don't get your hopes up because the social media platforms will take down the profile but then the person just pops up with a brand new one. They won't give us any identification or any identifying information because of privacy and free speech laws. How did it get into his hands? He um, got this, we believe, on Wednesday night. Um, and he uh, took it on Sunday. So he snuck out the back door and had it delivered to the house while we were asleep and um, around our little camera through the back door and picked it up and brought it into the home. And we had no idea. Um, toxicology takes a long time to get back, so parents are left hanging for a while before they know what actually happened to their child. And without the social media helping you, uh, it's a mystery. We, we can't even get his phone unlocked 
without a court order and a death certificate to Apple. With your own child? Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about that, that fateful day. Coming up, why Dr. Berman and Sam say they're worried that it's just a matter of time before the drug dealer they believe killed their son could sell another teen deadly drugs and probably is active right now as we sit here and talk. That's next. At 3.30, you had taken a cheeseburger up to his room. How was he? No hint that this would be the last time that I would see my son alive. What was the last thing you said to him? Tomorrow. Shut the f hell! I'm trying to listen to you yell at me! And that was only 10 seconds of their 27-hour road trip. Toxic love. You call her names. What do you call her? But, I mean, just about anything under the sun. Has he choked you? Yes. Has he dragged you by the hair? Yes. Have you shoved her? Yeah. New Dr. Phil. How is this okay with you? That's tomorrow and next Tuesday. Shocking developments in the case of the Bakersfield 3. Bailey was charged with Micah's murder. How does this affect you guys getting along? Can her son help solve this mystery? Will you tell the lead detective everything you know? That's next Tuesday. This is Sammy's special cast. Oh, that was fun. It's my baby shark egg cut. That's kind of gross. This is the Sammy face wash in the morning. Look at you. Do you like them? Are they everything you hope and want? Yeah. Happy birthday. So what would you say about quantum love? I think quantum love can really fix any relationship, no matter how broken or bent it is. Television host and relationship doctor, Dr. Laura Berman, and her husband, Sam Chapman, say their 16-year-old son, Sammy, overdosed and died after he ingested a pain or anti-anxiety pill they believe was unknowingly laced with the powerful drug fentanyl. Now, it was allegedly purchased on Snapchat and delivered to him. Now, they're here today hoping that by sharing their story, they can save even one family from experiencing the pain they're going through today. You are anything but a clueless parent. Anything but. I mean, you are, you are dialed in, and I you, you and Sam uh, are active parents engaged with your kids you had a great relationship with sam at at, at 3 30 you had taken a, a cheeseburger up to his room how was he he was fine thanks dad i love you he was playing his computer game with his friends i could hear them talking back uh, nothing unusual no hint that this would be the last time that i would see my son alive okay and what was the last thing you said to him i love you fortunately, and I take some comfort from the fact that he didn't kill himself. The horrible scene that we walked in on, the only thing could have, that could have been worse is if it had been intentional. He would have never, like the last thing he wanted to do was die, this kid. He had so many dreams and plans. So regarding those plans, an hour and a half later, you go up because you want to talk to him about the internship. I was following up on him that morning, asking me to come talk to him. And unfortunately, our son walked into the room in front of me mm -hmm. and saw him first and spun oh. on his heels. And then I walked in and found him. Take me through the moment that you walked through that door. <sighs> um, While well, my son spun on his heels, slammed the door behind him and said, Sammy's on the floor. And I walk in, and I saw him pale and in a pool of vomit. And I screamed for, and he wasn't, I was trying, and I was shaking, but I was trying to feel a pulse. And at the same time, I'm screaming for Sam. And he came up and started um, administering CPR while I called the ambulance. And the paramedics got there very quickly. It probably was within three to five minutes. Uh, it felt like, you know, an eternity, but it was very quick. And... Then they worked on him for probably 30 minutes and then came down and told us that he was gone. 
And what was it like to hear those words? Um, I don't really remember, but I mean, I remember hearing it. I don't remember doing this, but evidently, according to my husband and my son, um, you know, I screamed for a long time. And as my younger son put it, you know, it sounded like someone was killing you. And I said it felt like that. Because it, it hits you at that point because you, you had to know this was bad. I knew when I came, when I, after the paramedics started working on him, I, I mean, I have bruises all over me. I was just throwing myself around the floor, praying to God and just praying that he would breathe again. How do you wrap your head around the, the world without Sammy in it? I mean, how does... I don't know yet. Feels like our heart is broken. You know, that's a saying, but you can feel it as if someone's hurt your heart. It's hard to breathe. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be around anymore. I know we will be okay eventually, <laughs> but I don't yet know how we'll get there. Waking up in the morning and yeah. it dawns on you that the world is not a safe place and your son isn't around. But there's a few seconds before you realize he's not here. I'm not aware of a few seconds. <laughs> it just hits you right away. There is no, there, there's nothing bigger. There's, there's nothing that makes it go away. If you wake up in the middle of the night, it's there. Yeah. Um, the only thing that has helped, doesn't help with the grief and the pain, but the helplessness and the rage that goes along with the grief and the pain, you know, getting the word out and trying to, you know, help other families stop this from happening to their children helps with that piece. It doesn't help with the pain and the grief, but at least it's like easier to hold if it's not wrapped up with the, so much helplessness and rage. And we hope that dealer knows that the police are breathing down his neck and that he's aware of all of this publicity and hiding in his hidey hole somewhere, scared to death. Well, I have a very bright light, and that's why I wanted to shine it on this story. We're going to talk more about getting this word out when we come back. We're talking about a topic that really affects all of us. I'm back with Sam Chapman and his wife, Dr. Laura Berman. Uh, their son, Sammy, was taken from them on February 7th from a drug overdose. This was not intentional. This was not a drug user. This was not a young man that lived in this world. He was not a drug addict. Uh, he was not a rebel, but right now, with the internet, uh, you can order these drugs up the way you order up food to be delivered. But the problem is, when you buy things that are not from an FDA-regulated pharmacy, you don't know what you're getting. I mean, you think, well, why would a drug dealer put something in drugs that would kill the user? Well, they put this in the drugs because it gets the user hooked faster, but they don't know how to regulate it. They're playing Russian roulette, and they played it with your son, and... And it seems with thousands and thousands, I cannot tell you how many parents... We, we had to start, like, a Facebook support group because it was so many parents who the same thing has happened to their children, their kids just like ours and delivered through social media. And you're absolutely right. The drug dealers want to make an addict out of you. And fentanyl is twice as addictive as heroin. Mm. But it takes like, you know, a fingernail's worth Just, to kill you. This should be criminal because this is foreseeable. Oh, it's, this it, is yeah. beyond gross negligence. Oh, yeah. This is wanton, reckless disregard for the health and well-being of, of, of the user. And this is homicide. This it is, is the criminal. homicide detectives are, are on it, and it is con it's not considered an overdose. It is considered fentanyl poisoning. When it is not intentionally taken, it is poisoning and murder. We want 
people to understand and to educate their kids. It, you're buying this stuff on the street. You have no idea what you're getting. No. It is a crapshoot, and, and the stakes are your life. Yeah. That's right, over 30,000 deaths a year now from fentanyl poisoning. Do you know how Sammy paid for this drug? No, we don't know, and we weren't giving him money. It had been a long time since anyone had gone out of the house to buy anything, and so I, I, you know, we hadn't given him any spending money for almost a year. Are his friends coming forward and telling you any intel about this? Are they, have they been using this menu? Are they... Well, without incriminating themselves, but I mean, are they telling you anything that's They're not helpful? telling us about their own behavior. They did give us the, they are helping, you know, they're talking to the police. The police have talked to them. They did give us the screenshot that our son sent them of this drug dealer. Um, but the big thing that I think is so important, it, and kids, you know, not just about protecting your kids from dying, but having the conversation with your kids, you know, there's this no snitch policy. And if we had known that our son had any kind of drug in his room, he would still be alive right now. And they don't tell on each other. And I understand why, because it has real social consequences, but now his friends are gonna have to, and I said that to his friend. I was like, I understand why you didn't snitch, but I want you to also understand that not snitching is something you're now gonna have to live with because your friend is gone. You gotta understand, telling is not tattling. If somebody's putting their life in harm's way, man up and and say something to somebody that's responsible. It doesn't just happen to somebody else. It doesn't just happen to other people's children. Because if it can happen to y'all's child, trust me, it can happen to anyone. When we come back, we're going to meet another family. We're going to add them to this conversation. They say almost the same thing happened to their teenage son. They drove all the way through the snow from Minnesota to be here with me, Dr. Berman, and Sam. And you'll find out how they are involved in all of this when we come back. Caden came running. There's something wrong with Devin. He's not waking up. Tom ran up there, and I was right behind him. And you could just tell he had been gone for some time. My mom was on the ground screaming, my baby, not my baby. Close captioning. When I saw Dr. Laura's story about her son passing, my heart broke for her. There are so many parents that are in the same boat as Dr. and Laura. What keeps us going right now is trying to build as much awareness as we can to the fentanyl epidemic. The society, the stigma surrounding it, it's awful. They blame the parents, they blame the kids, but they don't place the blame on the people who are putting it out there, killing our kids. The Noring family says they are living through the same pain as Dr. Berman and her husband, Sam. Their 19-year-old son was a promising athlete and musician, also an honor student. They say they believe dental pain led him down a dark and dangerous path to his death. Our son, Devin, passed away April 4th. The night before, he was hanging out with a friend, he came downstairs, and he asked me if he could melt butter for his waffles. And I told him he was a goof as he went up the stairs. And that was the last time I saw him. I was cooking some ravioli, and I could hear Devin snoring. I don't know, I just didn't think much of it. The next day, I asked his brother to go wake up Devin. He'd come back downstairs and said that the door was locked. I unlocked the door, and he was just sort of lying there on the bed. I thought he was maybe asleep, and uh, that's sort of when I realized that he had foam coming out of his mouth. A kid came running. There's something wrong with Devin. He's not waking up. Tom ran up there, and I was right behind him. And you could just tell he had been gone for some time. And I just remember curling up in the corner yelling at Tom to do something. My mom was on the ground screaming. She was yelling, my baby, not my baby. When the ambulance came, I asked him, like, are you sure there's nothing you can do? 
He said, no, there's nothing we can do. I'm sorry. We found out from the toxicology report that he had pure fentanyl in his system. There was zero Percocet. He had enough fentanyl in him to kill several people. I think if Devin knew what was in that pill, I don't think he would have taken it. I play it back in my head a lot. And I try not to because it's, it will drag you down into this really dark place. The thing about Devin is he really loved life, like a lot. Literally lived it to the fullest every day. Bridget Thomas, thank it's you amazing. for being here. I'm sorry for the circumstance. And I'm so terribly sorry for your loss. Thank you. You guys actually met through a group that y'all have started, and the name of the group is Parents for Safer Children? Parents, I, yes, because there was an onslaught from beautiful souls like this, and I, and I was just buried in grief and not sure what to do with it. And I think it was you that said start a group. Um, and it's just been heartbreaking and also just so beautiful because all of these amazing parents are coming together. Mm -hmm and sharing support and stories. And tell me about Devin. He was just a really good kid. He was so full of life. He was funny. He could make you laugh. He was in honors classes throughout his whole junior high and high school. Um, he worked full time. And Again, we're not talking about a child here that was walking on the wild side, right? Right. You had a great relationship with him, right? That's right. And he had had some dental work done. Yeah, so he was having a lot of dental pain. He was a um, like a mouth grinder, like a nervous mouth grinder when he slept. He did get in and have half of his mouth fixed, um, but it was really hard for him to get into the have the other second half fixed because of the COVID. And and. You believe that he, he got this pill from a friend? Yeah. And the friend, you believe, got the pills from a pill dealer on Snapchat? There's yeah. allegedly two pill dealers in our town. They use Snapchat. These are not like your typical drug dealers. These are people that my son went to school with, you know, and like you mentioned, the kids, they... They all will cover for each other. You see it as being a snitch, but what's worse, being a snitch or being a hero and saving somebody's life. Was Devin close with his siblings? Yes. Well, we're going to talk more about that and how this actually went down because just like Sam was in Sammy's room at 3.30, uh, Devin was in the kitchen 30 minutes before this all fell apart. It's just how fast tragedy strikes. We'll talk about that when we come back. Tomorrow. Shut the hell! I'm trying to listen to you yell at me! And that was only 10 seconds of their 27-hour road trip. Toxic love. You call her names. What do you call her? But, I mean, just about anything under the sun. Has he choked you? Yes. Has he dragged you by the hair? Yes. Have you shoved her? Yeah. New Dr. Phil. How is this okay with you? That's tomorrow and next Tuesday. Shocking developments in the case of the Bakersfield 3. Bailey was charged with Micah's murder. How does this affect you guys getting along? Can her son help solve this mystery? Will you tell the lead detective everything you know? That's next Tuesday. Closed captioning provided by... When you love your pet like family, you want to feed him like family. That's why every Blue Buffalo recipe is made with the finest natural ingredients. You'll find Blue wherever you buy pet food. We're talking to Dr. Laura Berman and her husband Sam, who tragically lost their son, shockingly, just a few weeks ago. Uh, Bridget and Thomas have joined us as well. They, again... This is out of the blue. Uh, lost their son, Devin. Robin has joined us. I'm sitting here watching the horror on your face at what's happened here. Well, what are you thinking about this? It, it really is. It's 
devastating, of course, to hear uh, how easy it is for your, that both of your children were able to obtain these drugs that took their lives so quickly. I've sat here for every show that you've been taping now for 19 years, and it's, it seems that it's getting worse. They're getting younger. It's getting easier for them to get these drugs, and it, it is just, it's heartbreaking because when we were raising our uh, boys, now they're grown men, but we never came up against anything like this. And, and so it is, it's very heartbreaking. And uh, one thing I would like to add that comes from the experience that we had raising our boys is that uh, this snitch kind of mentality it was just very much the case when we were raising our boys. So one thing that we did that uh, I think really made a difference is we would sit the boys down and I would tell them, you know, you don't have to snitch on your friends. Just come to me. Tell me when you see something going on. Bullying was a big thing when our boys were in school. Uh, like I said, the drugs were not as badly as bad, but bullying was really bad. And I would say, just come to me and tell me when you see your friends or anyone else being bullied, and I will take responsibility for being the snitch. And then I would call their parents. I would call their mom, and I'd say, I don't know if you know this, and but your son is being bullied. And I did that all the time. And then the mothers would always seem to just break down and go, oh, is that what it is? Because they wouldn't tell their moms. They would be embarrassed. I'm being bullied. And moms would never tell them who told. Hopefully that might be some answer for what works today. If you see your friends taking drugs, because it really touched my heart so much when you said that, you know, if you had just told me, my son would still be alive today. I didn't today. say it harshly to him because mm -hmm. I don't want to torment this poor kid. You know, I'm sure he feels guilty enough, but I tried to use it as a teachable moment to call him to consciousness that, you know, I get not wanting to snitch, but uh -huh. now the stakes are higher. Parents need to know that the stakes are totally different now. That's right. Very and hard. children need to know that the stakes right. are totally different now and some stupid experimentation now it seems the fentanyl is everywhere. Well, the stakes are, are very high. And there was another person involved with Devin because at 1030, he was in the kitchen acting completely normal, right? Correct. Yeah. Nothing, he nothing out of the ordinary. He came downstairs and he was laughing and he said, I'm going to make waffles and I'm going to go to bed. And I said, okay. And you heard a loud noise about 11? I heard a loud bang. And I remember yelling, you know, up the stairs, like, what are you guys doing up there? This is Caden. Mm -hmm. you, you saw the friend leaving, right? Uh, I asked him if my brother was okay because I could hear a loud snoring or what seemed to be choking. So I asked him if my brother was okay and he just sort of said yeah and he shrugged it off and went to the bathroom. He used the bathroom and then left. He didn't even alert any of us. I mean, Caden would have been the one to have alerted. Mm -hmm. and this person knew he he admitted through snapchat again after several kids in our town took to what did you do what happened to Devin and he admitted to my daughter's now ex-boyfriend that he poured water on Devin's head he we checked believe that's his pulse why he was in the bathroom and checked his breathing and getting then water right he left in the room what did you find i think that was the worst part for me knowing that there was nothing i could do talk to me about what happened the next afternoon when you went up there at so after two the next morning we all got up it was kind of late i mean it was saturday and i had asked his brother to go wake him up i said you know, go wake your brother up. And Caden had gone upstairs and he had came back down and he was like, um, his door's locked. I, I don't want to like wake him up because he didn't want to get yelled at for waking his brother up. And I said, no, he slept long enough. Lunch is going to be here. Go wake him up. And so at that point, Caden had gone back upstairs and he had to actually pick the bedroom door lock. I think the hardest part is knowing that we could have had a chance to save him. God, that kid just spoke up. I mean, it's not guaranteed, but at least we would have had that chance. And we never got that chance. When you went in the room, what did you find? I heard Caden kind of yelling, Dad, 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 Devin's not waking up. And I could tell by the tone of his voice that something was wrong. 
I immediately just bent down and grabbed him and I was going to start giving him CPR. I remember going through CPR in my head. But as soon as I touched him, I knew that he had been gone for a while. He was cold and he was just laying there. I just remember looking at his face. And at that point, I could hear my wife kind of coming down the hallway. She was just hysterical, like, like you had mentioned. And I remember her leaning against the wall and just falling to the ground and just yelling at me to do something. Thank you. And I think that was the worst part for me, knowing that there was nothing I could do. You try so hard to protect your kids. You know, I just, it, it haunts me. It feels like I failed them somehow. These wonderful <laughs> parents think, you know, my children are in the house. They're in their rooms. They're up there tucked away. They're safe. Sadly, that's no longer the reality in which we parent. We'll be right back. Close capsule. Visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, live strategies, and exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on DrPhil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. Haley, is there anything you'd like to add? I just really wish someone would have told us. If you had a chance to talk to your brother today, what would you say to him? That I love him. I wish more than anything I could give him one last hug, because that was our thing. We would give each other hugs. And I remember the week before he died, I was actually over, and he was trying to get out of giving me a hug. And I said, no, you're hugging me. And he gave me a big hug. And that's the last time I saw him. Tell me the name of this group and how people can find it. Um, it's a Facebook group, uh, Parents for Safer Children. There are several thousand parents on there right now supporting each other. Um, and it's beautiful, but in a terrible way because they all have a similar story. And, you know, this is not going away. We are being attacked by fentanyl right now. Children everywhere are dying, and it is a big deal, and no one has been talking about it. Well, I want to thank my very courageous guest today, the Nori... Dr. Laura Berman and Sam Chapman, uh, they bravely shared their stories in hopes that their son's losses will not be in vain, that their lives can be used to help your family. Don't let it fall on deaf ears. They are asking you to talk to your children, to warn them, to do everything you can to protect them. These were two promising young men with bright futures at a vulnerable age who experimented with something they thought 
was harmless. They thought it was a one-off and it killed them. We want to remember both of their lives. 